Good Sunday afternoon, and thank you for joining with me for Second Chances with Jim McGreevy. I'd also like to thank you for joining, being part of this podcast, and listening to my very first guest, somebody who taught me the importance of second chances and maybe third and fourth and sixth and seven chances. But at this time, I'd also like to plug the New Jersey Reentry Corporation's annual reentry conference, which will be coming up on April 1st. Uh, we'll be having such luminaries as Governor Chris Christie, Al Sharpton, Van Jones, uh, many dedicated physicians and doctors looking as people move from trauma to hopefully triumph. And again, that's on April 1st. Hopefully you get a chance to look at our website and be part of signing up and registering for the New Jersey Reentry Conference. So when I, when I thought about uh, who could be our first guest, you know, Second Chances is all about understanding that we all make mistakes in life, and that's a very human experience. And someone who has been so good and merciful with me is none other than my father, Jack McGreevy. And with that, I'd like to introduce John Patrick McGreevy, USMC, proud son of Jersey City. Dad? Hello. Hey there, sir. How are you doing today? No complaints, Dad. Happy Sunday. So, Dad, could you tell us a little bit about growing up in Jersey City and what it means to you and some of those struggles and what was life back then in dear old Jersey City? Well, my parents were both immigrants. They came over here by ship since there were no transcontinental airplanes in those days. But uh, when I was a young man, we did not have a refrigerator. We had, like everybody else, an icebox in the house. Now, our icebox was about four feet high, and there was a section to put a piece of ice in there that would give everything else cold. And our Nelson, our ice man, would drive around the neighborhood hollering and melts and ice, and my family would send me out to get a 10 cent piece of ice. And he would cut that up and bring it into the house for a dime. I couldn't believe that. <laughs> I was and how, and how big was the ice, block. Dad? How big was the block of ice? It was a small piece that fit into the freezer part of the refrigerator. It couldn't be very big because Space was at a premium. So, so and, uh, can you tell it, us where you lived, what street? It, where did you live, Dad? What street did you live in Jersey City? I lived on 50 Lafayette Street. And what was that in like? section of Jersey City. And, and who lived in Lafayette section? Like, what, what was it an ethnic group? Was it? How would you describe it? Oh, no, it was a great, a great different group. We had a lot of people from Europe. And there was a big mix. And, big, and where did wonderful. you go to church? Where did your family go to church? I went to church at All Saints Church. All right. And where do you go to grammar school and high school? Well, I went to grammar school at All Saints Church. That was a big thing, because I only lived two blocks away from the church and from the school. And then when I had to go to high school, it was up to me to pick where I wanted to go. So my mother and father, they were from the old country. And I don't think either one of them graduated high school or grammar school for that matter. So. Uh, so that was I a big deal to, go, to go to high school. I went to Ferris High School downtown because my buddy was going to Ferris High School. So, so what did Grandpa do for a living? Grandpa, first he worked on the Erie Railroad. He was a brakeman out in the freight yards. But then later, when he got married, the Depression came along, 
and you couldn't get four days from the railroad. So uh, he was invited to take a job with the police department. And through a connection, he got a job. And uh, he had good credentials because he was a, a veteran, honorably discharged veteran from World War I. And while he was in the military, he became a staff sergeant. So he had that on his record. And he had some class and some smarts. So uh, he got a job with the Forbes Precinct. And uh, at first, he was a horseback out. Because everybody in the uh, island rode horses. But he was assigned later, James, a police booth at the corner of Pacific and Communipore Avenue. That was in the vicinity of All Saints Church and the bank. So they needed the cop on that corner. And so, so he was the was right Irish cop to be on the Irish corner. He was the right guy to be there. Hey, Dad, it's almost St. Patrick's Day. What does it mean to be Irish? Dad? Well, if you look in the last year section, being Irish was part of the deal. We had probably a majority of mix in the last year section, although we had a great mix of other people from Europe. So, uh, What did it mean to be Irish, though? Well, in those days, it was a big thing because uh, my father was a cop. And in those days, that was a big deal for a family to have a police officer. And uh, so when I went to school, I, I got good credentials because my dad was a cop and the kids, they took care of me. All right. And, uh, so could you tell us about your first job in Jersey City? What was your first job? Jersey City. Well, I was about 10 years old, and my friend on Pine Street, he owned a uh, corner grocery store. It was an Italian store owned by an Italian immigrant. Yeah. And his son, Joe, had a horse and wagon that he kept in the uh, garage on Pine Street. So that was my first job. Joe used to, every morning he had to go to Newark with the horse and wagon to buy a lot of goods that he would sell during the day. And he would pack up the wagon and myself and another buddy would meet him about 8.30 and get on the wagon and go around the neighborhood and we would just holler out, potatoes, buy pound for quarter, apples, and because there were no shop rights, and uh, we had the market closed for a while. So but, that's not uh, a bad job. How much did you get paid? With tips and clips, it maybe comes to a dollar and a quarter a day. A dollar and a quarter a day. Hey, it's an honest a wage. A dollar and a quarter. That was funny those days. <laughs> exactly. All right. So tell me a little bit about the Marine Corps. Why did you enlist in the Marine Corps? Oh, I listed in the Marine Corps on my 17th birthday. My brother served in the Marine Corps, and he had been awarded the Navy Cross posthumously for heroic action on Iwo Jima. And prior to that, he was awarded the Bronze Star with the V for Valor on Saipan. So uh, when I went into the boot camp, I was uh, delighted. Boot camp was a piece of cake for me because I was a Jersey City street kid, and I enjoyed boot camp. So, so tell us about signing up. You, you got turned away first, didn't you? When I had my physical, I had to go to New York, and uh, it was my 17th birthday. And it was really um, solving my boyhood dream. And when the guy gave me the physical, they sent me home. 
I seen four refs. Because I had a perforated, deviated nasal septum, which I still have. And the guy said, I'm sorry, kid, you can't make it. So I had a big argument. He called the doctor over. He said, look at this kid. He's giving me a hard time. And I'll never forget to my dying day, when he looks up my nose, I had it operated on when I was 13 years of age. And... uh, the doctor said, holy Christ, hey, Joe, look at this one. And I realized then and there, I was the local uh, freak. And uh, I cried my heart out and I went home. So three months later, when my friend Tommy McDonald turned 17, I took him to the North Post Office. And below the North Post Office, the Marine Corps had a little small office for the recruiter, and uh, I went to see this guy, and uh, I caught this guy coming off uh, alcohol weekend. <laughs> he was a recruiter, so I told him my father had been in the army. I had another brother in the navy. My brother Jimmy was in the marine, so he gave me a physical sitting down, and after telling my story to him, I passed my physical. And that's how I got in the Marine Corps. That's a heck of a story. So, Dad, you've always said the Marine Corps changed your life. How did it change your life? Oh, it was the best thing that ever happened. Why? Because they gave you discipline like no, like nobody else. And, uh, you don't have all my papers on. The pants down but uh, well, the Marine Corps. Go ahead. Even today, boot camp is 90 days of 19 hour days from 5.30 in the morning to 9.30 at night, 90 days back to back. No, no television, no movies, no newspapers, no radio. And they got you going for a double time for 90 days in a row. And how and did it, it change was, you? Well, it gives you a discipline that you don't get in the other place. And so, as a result, I got some training from them. And eventually, I became a sergeant because I loved everything we were doing. And I worked at it. So I just got kicked upstairs. And I got my three stripes. And then after I, I went to Japan and I went to uh, China and then I went to Guam and it was great training. Well, Guam was a hot place. And in fact, uh, when we went to Guam, we had a trip one night to the uh, Navy place, and as we went to this Navy place, there was a guy sitting there in a beach chair. He just waved us in like it was uh, Coney Island. And uh, we got in there, and everything was fantastic. But on the way in, there was a big fan there, a very large fan that was blowing on this guy. And I was keeping, and he had a uh, his little white hat on that those sailors like to wear. They're cute. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, as we were into the place, I said, "Holy Christ, this is so much better than what we're leaving." When we went to Guam, we had to go to a place where they had to break up a mountain. And they put us in tents with third floors. And it was just god awful. So what uh, did you do with the fan? Well, at the uh, Navy Recreation Center, at 4.30 in the evening, the security guy went home and everybody called up the place. So I said to my truck driver, I said, listen, Tomorrow, I want you to come out late 
at about 5 o'clock rather than 4.30. He said, what for? I said, I have to put my plan in action, but it has to be after 4.30 when everybody else goes home. So he says, okay, I'll let you go to bed. You've got 5.20, then the hell, I'm out of here. I said, so all I need is 20 minutes. So I went to the fan, and I was trying to yank it off because uh, with my bayonet there, trying to get it out of the thing. So finally, I was able to rip it off, and my guys in the truck gave me a big hand. and said, come on, McGreen, we were moving out. So I had to run after the six by to throw up the fan and then jump, on, jump up there. And uh, so things went well for about a week. And then the first sergeant came to us and he said, he got a note from the provost marshal. Somebody had stolen some Marine Corps equipment. And he wanted to know if we know who it was. We said it might have been somebody else. It wasn't us. But anyway, he said, I want you to make sure and anyway, we had to give it up to the first sergeant, and he let us go. That's that a good one. Something. Hey, Dad, so tell us a little bit about, you, you told me the story of, of being on the LT and going from Guam to China and the equipment nearly going through the ship. James, I was on LST 1141. <clears throat> In those days, LSTs only had numbers, no names. But I was on LSD and we're going from China to Guam. But we got caught in the ice storm. Now, an LSD, James, is 300 yards long. It's like three football fields long. And we had the top deck loaded with everything you could think of. We had jeeps up there. We had big trucks up there. Anything and everything. So since I'm in an LST without a, a keel, there's normally a keel that's supposed to keep the ship straight up. But LSTs were made to hit the beach. And the Navy apparently forgot that. And they're using us to go through a big ice storm and uh, we just got moved out right? at three o'clock in the morning. In the Marine Corps, everybody has fire watch. No matter where you are, where you are, you normally get fire watch. So that night I was on fire watch. And this captain sees me there, 3 a.m., I'm having a cup of coffee. Everything is freezing outside. But they couldn't even close our hatch to lock my section where we slept. And they had to put us in with the uh, with the troops. But that, that was a big problem for the troops because we were taking more space than we were entitled to. I said, I checked the log of this vessel. This is the first time that it carried tanks. I was with the second tank battalion of the second Marine division. And our tanks were in the hold of the ship. But in the meantime, with all the rocking back and forth, everything was moving all over. James, everything on top deck got washed overboard. Trucks, jeeps, and all other kinds of gear. And I have a picture in my marine book to show everybody. Because when we went to Guam, they still had a... Uh, 105 howitzer hanging over the side of the ship. and uh, But the captain wanted to know if I was on guard duty. He said, well, if the tanks start to go through, you must come and get me. And I said, why would I do that? He says, well, I have the public and I can alert everybody. I said, for Christ's sake, it's about 40 degrees below zero in the water now. I'd rather not tell my people, but uh, they're going to jump in the water and have cause the phobia, whatever the hell they get there from the ice. Frostbite, yeah. The last 10 minutes. So when he called back there, there was another LSD following us, 
And he says, you got to come up here and stay alongside of us so we can get something squared away. Eventually, the other guy came up, and they tried to straighten some of the stuff from falling overboard. But it all fell overboard anyway, right outside of Guadalcanal. But the next couple of days, we went to Guam, and everything worked out nicely. So, Dad, could you tell me a little bit about, like you told me, the importance of when what it meant for Uncle Jimmy's sacrifice and what it meant to your family and your father and what it meant to be a Marine and Uncle Jimmy to give his life? Since my father was an immigrant who served in the, uh, he served with the uh, American Expeditionary Force in 1918 in World War One. Yep. He was Pro, uh, pro signing up because he thought it was a great thing to do being for your country. And uh, so my dad was a gung ho guy. He became a staff sergeant, by the way. In fact, uh, my cousin just sent me some photos and I see his stripes on his sleeve there. So he, yep. he did pretty good for an Irish immigrant. He, I'm sure he did. Could you talk a little bit about during the war and, and how people found out whether their loved ones had been killed? Tell me the story about the, the Western Union on the bike. During World War II, when anybody got hurt or killed, they had no way of notifying people because most people did not own a telephone. We were one of the few homes in the area that had a telephone that was put in there by the uh, instructions of the uh, township because he was a police officer, but yeah. nobody else had a phone. And uh, so they wanted us to know. In those days, when we the young kids, we would hang out because there was no television home to keep us there. So we would hang out on the corners and the uh, union guy would be on his bike and if he drove into your neighborhood, he said, holy Christ, I hope he's not in, into our area. But he came, and all he did was, he gave you a dinky little telegram that said as little as possible. And it said something like, dear Mr. McGreevy, we regret to advise you that your son James Edward was killed on the 19th, 45 at Iwo Jima. He gave his life in the service of his country. More details will follow later. Boom, that was it. They didn't tell you much more or where he's going to be buried or anything like that. So uh, when that guy with that bike came in your neighborhood, you didn't want him to stop at your house. But unfortunately, they did. Yeah. I'd like to tell you what they told us in boot camp. One of the most interesting thing about the Marine Corps is a time-honored tradition. And it's called, in case you're not familiar with it, it's called the honor of institutional theft. It's a time-honored tradition of military units to have stolen from one another for years. But the Marine Corps has brought institutional theft to a higher degree, more so than anyone else, because we are more broke. The Marine Corps, for your information, is the low cost GI. We cost less money to stay in business than an Army guy or a Navy guy. So we had a deal where it is a legitimate, the exhilaration of the, of the death, but more because of the poverty. There are a few unwritten rules. You may steal for your outfit, but not for personal or monetary gain. And the rules become more relaxed when it comes to other services. But when it comes to the civilian world, it's pretty much open season. So, so who would you steal from, the Navy? James, when I borrowed 
they fan off the main gate in Guam, the first sergeant said he had a note from the provost marshal about somebody stole it. And he said, I'm supposed to find out who did. And we said, well, <laughs> well, look around for you, Top. You call the guy Top, he was the first sergeant. Yeah. Well, look around for you. I think you won't have to look too far. So I said, we said, well, it might have been some Navy guys. All right, so tell me, can you tell me a little bit about how you met mom? When I was about 25 years of age, I thought it might be about time I started to think about settling down. So I went to St. Hall University looking for a wife. And I got more out of St. Hall than most guys. I got a degree and I got a wife. And as luck would have it, I had to sign up for a special course to get extra credit to graduate. And by chance, I took music appreciation just to fill out the night. And so did Veronica, my future wife. So she was always coming in late. And in the music appreciation, we always had a different seat every week. So I would save her a seat. And uh, as a result, we got to be buddy buddy. And uh, she was always late. So I would save her a seat and I would bring lifesavers with me and I would offer her a lifesaver just to start the deal. And after a couple of times after that, I said, how about if I take you out Friday? I would pick her up at 221 Clay Street and we went to the movie. We went to the Stanley or the Lowell's Theater. And after the movie, I said, let's go to the pancake house over there that they had up on the Journal Square, not too far from the movie house. And so I think the good Lord wanted us to meet one another. And from there, everything went better. And eventually, I had a priest I'd see at all. He said, Jack, I see you with Veronica. It seems to me that uh, she would make somebody a good wife. And I said, Father, I'm not ready to yet. I'm shopping around. So he said, well, it looks like you got yourself a good act. And anyway, long story short, we were married in St. Patrick's Paris in Jersey City. And we were married for 62 years. Uh, when she passed away two years ago, but she was a beautiful and very dear wife and gave me three good kids. Except uh, at Jim McGreevy. We both, we both had to keep an eye on him. Bad politics. You know, you're from Hudson County, Jersey City, the epicenter, the new Jerusalem of all politics. What does it mean to be from Jersey City? And what does it mean to be a Democrat in Jersey City? And, you know, Governor Byrne used to always joke and say he wanted to be buried in Jersey City so he can stay active in Democratic politics. Why is Jersey City so special about politics? You lived in Jersey City, really, more than any other place I knew. You know who was your committee person, who was the mayor. And uh, I find out from talking to other people, we were more mindful of the political situation. Like in Jersey City, Mayor Frank Haight, he was a dear mayor to all of us. And every year at baseball season, he would have a bus pull up in front of the Democratic headquarters on Pacific Avenue. And he would load the bus up with all us kids. And on the way in the bus, they gave us a little ice cream Dixie. You know, the little ice cream thing? Yeah. With the little thing. <laughs> By the time Everybody's in the bus for 10 minutes. We would have a food fight. They were throwing the Dixies all over. Oh, it was more fun than going to the ball game. But we went to the ball game anyway. Dad, what does it mean to be an American? 
Let's read Tipper Tipper James. He's proud of the flag, and it's easy to be an American. But we got to protect our rights. The way we're living now, we've got too many hoople doopels out there getting away with murder. All right. Is there anything else you want to say? Well, James, I want to say you did a pretty good job with talking about politics. Coming up from Jersey City like you did, and all on your own, you decided to want to be the governor. But you had me out there, mommy out there, and the girls out there. We were all supporting you. And uh, what you was able to do was fantastic. You came, came up there without anybody having a whole lot of money that most guys need. And uh, you did a great job and we're very pleased with the job you did. God bless you, James Edwards. Semper Fi and all that good stuff. Well, thank you so much, Dad. Hey, Dad? Yeah? Th this whole thing is about second chances and giving guys a chance. How many chances did I have? How many chances did you give me? I don't know. <laughs> as many as you needed. We were happy. We were a happy group. It wasn't easy, but sometimes we had to get together and raise help with one another, which we did. But we came to it all pretty well. Very good. Well, Dad, thank you for giving me a second chance. And thank you for everything you represent, for your service to our nation, to community, the great Democratic Party, Jersey City, Semper Fi. Take care, Dad. God bless. God bless you. Thank you very much. Congratulations for the great job you did. Thank bye you, bye Dad. Now. And thank you very much to everybody who's joining with us. And the, and the reason why I wanted to start my, with my dad is because it's all about second chances. And it's all about learning a life. And I learned early it's about second chances and forgiveness, but trying to get things right and having the understanding that we all make mistakes. It's inevitably so human to make mistakes. And that's about second chances and third chances. And we shouldn't be defined by the worst decision we've made in our life because to err is human and to forgive is divine. But it's also having people willing to support us. You know, next month, uh, my guest will be Armani Shakur, who made a, a terrible decision, but the best decision that he could have made as a young man and paid a huge swath of his life behind the wall in prison. And Armani's going to talk about his chances, the chances he didn't get, the chances he did get, and how he's changing his life, and how he's paying it forward, working with young men that are over the age of 30 who have just come back home from prison. So I just want to say thank you to everybody listening to Second Chances with Jim McGreevy. I want to say thank you to Jack McGreevy, who in my early life I learned the lessons of making mistakes but trying to do better, trying to be held accountable. And I want to thank each and every one of you for understanding that the worst decision shouldn't define us. And with the community, we can build better young men, better young women to build a better community, a better state, and God willing, a better nation. Thanks, and have a great night and a great St. Patrick's Day.